Again, please note that this is being recorded. We will post this after editing to our Eisenhower Health website under cardiovascular um, presentations. We will also have it on our Eisenhower Health YouTube channel. And I will also, which he'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, Bill Stark with Mended Hearts uh, of the Coachella Valley is with us tonight as our co-host um, in our partnership with Eisenhower Health and our cardiac and cardiovascular center. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill to do a little quick intro and then introduce Dr. Rubin, Mr. Stark. Thanks, Brett, appreciate that very much. Uh, we are in this new exciting kind of arrangement with and partnership with Eisenhower Hospital and Eisenhower Health to uh, uh, present some of these cardiac lectures. And uh, the purpose is kind of to help us out, help both of us out to expand the knowledge and present this uh, information to more people in the Coachella Valley and even outside of the valley. As we know, we have several uh, chapter participants outside of our own down in Southern California. So we welcome you all to this particular, this particular session. Uh, 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 Mended Hearts is a group of support group. It's a national support group now in, two, in 20 foreign countries as well. And uh, we're kind of basically to go around the hospital and uh, meet with uh, heart patients and their families to offer hope and encouragement and some education. The second part we do is hold these, we have been holding sessions uh, uh, in the uh, education center here on the campus. And uh, Dr. Rubin has been with us over the years several times to talk to us about uh, the heart and what's going on, AFib and all those matters. Um, on a very personal note, I can tell you that he was recently my doctor, electrophy electrophysiologist doctor, working with my cardiologist doctor as we converted to a new um, antiarrhythmic medicine to control AFib and also reduce the, reduce the side effects of that uh, the other one that I was taking. And it's working well, and I appreciate that very much. So without other ado, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Andrew Rubin, who's going to talk to us about this advances in AFib. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time this afternoon to learn a little bit more about atrial fibrillation. I assume that many of you have a personal interest and therefore are taking the time to learn a little bit more. Uh, as many of you may know, I have been at Eisenhower for more than 27 years to this point. So here we go, AFib. Just to remind uh, everyone who doesn't know, I am from Philadelphia and I don't always eat heart healthy like I should. And this is a classic Philly cheesesteak. If you guys have not run into one of these before. So when we talk about heart problems, heart problems may be electrical, like that I deal with, or it could be non-electrical as well. The non-electrical are the plumbers and all their glory, while the electricians like myself and my two partners are in our glory. So in terms of non-electrical heart problems, we're talking about artery, muscle, valve problems such as heart attacks, heart failure, heart leaks, or heart stenosis, heart valve stenosis, aortic stenosis, or management of risk factors such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, congenital heart disease as well would be a non-electrical heart problem. The non-electrical heart problems of which artery problems is one type, you can see how the heart arteries run on the outside of the heart the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery and its multiple branches are on the outside of the heart. Here you see the aorta, the superior vena cava, while the electrical system resides inside the heart and structures known as the SA node, with people who have sick sinus syndrome, AV node, people with heart block, and people with bundle branch block problems. This is the electrical skeleton of the heart within the heart. So when talking about electrical problems, electrical problems can either be slow or fast heartbeats. Slow heartbeats are known as bradycardia, sick sinus syndrome, heart block, and these issues are most frequently treated with a pacemaker. While fast heartbeats are known as tachycardia, atrial fibrillation is one type of tachycardia. Other types of tachycardia are atrial flutter, Rhythm disturbances called SVT, 
rhythm disturbance is known as ventricular tachycardia. And these problems can be treated with medications, ablation, or devices known as defibrillators. So that is a differentiate of electrical problems. Other things that fall in the realm of electrical problems, people who have irregular heartbeats or palpitations. Usually patients will require some type of monitoring for a day, a week, or even as long as three years to help clarify the etiology of their palpitations. And treatment may involve changes in lifestyle, changes in medications, or possibly no treatment at all. Final electrical issue is syncope or passing out. One third of all people pass out at one time in their life. And we get concerned when there's recurrent syncope or syncope in the setting of structural heart disease. It's important for your healthcare provider to, to ask a lot of questions and do the physical examination to help clarify why you may have passed out. Sudden cardiac death is one type of electrical problem just by its name suggests the most severe type of electrical problem of the heart, most often caused by a rhythm disturbance known as ventricular fibrillation, which accounts for half of all cardiac deaths. The electrical system malfunctions, there's a very rapid heartbeat in the lower chambers, and the heart functioning stops. This is an example of someone who suffered cardiac arrest, where they are initially in a normal rhythm, they go into a very, very rapid heartbeat that within less than five minutes degenerates into a very erratic, irregular heartbeat that is really a non-functional heartbeat and eventually no heartbeat whatsoever and flat line. And that's sudden cardiac arrest. And then we move in to atrial fibrillation, which will be uh, the topic of the, the rest of the, of the talk. The, Previous part was an introduction leading up to atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a very chaotic rhythm of the atria or the upper chambers of the heart. The upper chambers of the heart go more than 400 beats per minute. It results in an irregular pulse. So this is the lower chamber of the heart making the pulse. And the pulse is erratic, but not nearly as rapid or erratic as the upper chambers of the heart. And we'll play this. And you can see everything's nice and nice and regular, and then boom. And the upper chambers are fibrillating, and the lower chambers beat irregular. And that's the essence of atrial fibrillation, the very rapid, chaotic upper chamber rhythm disturbance. So why, why would you get atrial fibrillation? Well, it could be from cardiac problems such as high blood pressure, valve problems, heart failure, or weak heart muscle a new heart attack, or inflammation of the heart called pericarditis. Also, it could be from non-cardiac reasons. If you have sleep apnea that's not treated, if you've had a blood clot to your lungs, if you have emphysema or severe asthma, if you are very sick in general in the hospital, you may develop atrial fibrillation. If you have thyroid disease, abnormal electrolytes, or if you've just been under stress from surgery and you're recovering from that, you may develop atrial fibrillation. Sometimes we just don't have a good reason and it's called lone atrial fibrillation or idiopathic atrial fibrillation. You may have genetic causes where you have multiple members of your family have atrial fibrillation and there's no obvious reason. And usually it's related to ion channels or potassium channel dysfunction. Most very importantly, we've learned in the last couple of years how important alcohol and obesity are in causing atrial fibrillation. So I always tell my patients moderation, moderation, moderation. However, when it comes to AFib, the patient may say, may find out that drinking any alcohol may trip them into atrial fibrillation and alcohol may be done. Very important, losing weight that may be the most effective therapy for atrial fibrillation is weight loss. So not only does your healthcare provider have to be knowledgeable on how to treat your atrial fibrillation, but you are gonna to have to commit yourself possibly to some lifestyle changes to help us help you. Well, what can AFib do to me? So what, what if I have it? I'm gonna keep drinking, I don't care if I have it. Well, 
You could have a stroke, so probably not a good idea. Let's avoid that. You may just not feel as well in atrial fibrillation. You're more likely to be hospitalized. You may have bleeding problems because you're probably gonna be on a blood thinner if you're having problems with atrial fibrillation. You may develop congestive heart failure from atrial fibrillation. And that could be from the fibrillation being too fast or the normal synchrony or the normal contribution of the various chambers to the pumper of the heart is lost. There's the, uh, there's the cost of medicines, the office visits, the hospitalizations involved. And of course, no one likes taking medications because of the possibility of side effects. So there's a lot of things that AFib can do that are very bad or very annoying. So what do we do to treat it? Well, number one is let's prevent stroke. And that'll be the last part of this talk. We'll talk about preventing AFib recurrence. And then we'll talk about, well, maybe you can live in the FIB. Some people who have AFib, the speed is controlled. They're on their blood thinner. They feel absolutely fine. Especially in the older population, it may be just fine to stay in AFib and just control the speed. And we'll talk about this coming up. So controlling the rate of AFib, as I just mentioned, is important to prevent heart failure. And not everyone needs to have their AF cured, as I just discussed. We can use medications to prevent the FIB. So you may be in FIB, but the rate will be 70 beats per minute, and that may be perfectly fine. But sometimes the medications aren't enough, and we must do a procedure called ablation of the AV node. Now, ablation of the AV node is different than ablation for cure. This will control the speed of the FIB. It does not cure the FIB. So it's a different procedure. AV nodal ablation, as I've been just talking about the last couple of minutes, makes the pulse at normal speeds, the fibrillation no longer races, and it's no longer irregular. So some people who have AFib that are symptomatic from it, if we just control their speed and regularize their pulse so it's no longer erratic, they feel just perfectly well. And we'll think about this in, page, in drugs that are not working to control the speed, the drugs that are not tolerated to control the speed, or patients are just sick and tired of taking medications, will con we'll consider an AV node ablation, which has over 90 95% success rate, and it's done in less than an hour. But you need a pacemaker to go with the AV node ablation. That's the catch. The upper chambers are still in FIB. You're just not going fast. So since the upper chambers are still in FIB, you may have residual symptoms and you do need your blood thinner. So a very good procedure, keeping in mind mostly that you do need a pacemaker. This is an example of AV node ablation where a patient here is fast, irregular rhythm. We do the ablation and you see the heartbeat stops and you have this flat line here and then the pacemaker kicks in. The pacemaker is nice and regular, nice and slow at 70 beats per minute. So we've taken this erratic fast stuff and made it regularized and no longer fast. It's so easy, anybody can do it. Even my dogs, Phil, <laughs> Phil and Rufo, it's from, it's from Christmas time. So let's talk about how to suppress AFib. So we've rate controlled the FIB, but the FIB's still symptomatic. And you know we gotta do something more. We need to suppress it. We need to regain sinus rhythm. We can look at antirhythmic drugs. Many of you guys have been on these drugs in the past. Flecainide and propofenone are very powerful sodium channel block, sodium channel blocking agents. But there's also class three drugs that are potassium channel block. Patients that are free used to suppress AFib. Advantages of taking pills to suppress AFib as opposed to ablation curative ablation, is that about half the people will have success in suppression of their AFib, a low initial cost, and non-invasive. The disadvantages is that it's a high recurrence rate of about 
long-term there's a cost. You're not curing the problem. All drugs may have side effects and sometimes the side effects can be dangerous. Not commonly, thank goodness. So let's move on to catheter ablation. Now this is different than what we talked about five minutes ago with AV node ablation. This is catheter ablation for cure. Wires are put in from the groins, are passed into the upper chambers of the heart, and we alter the electrical characteristics to minimize fib from occurring. So the patients typically come in to Eisenhower on a given morning. They go to a pre-op area where they meet the nurse and the anesthesiologist. They're brought to the electrophysiology operating suite where there will be three physicians, four nurses, a couple EP techs, and uh, engineers from the company all working in the, in the room. And this is at the beginning of the procedure where we, and the, the patient is under general anesthesia. The procedure takes anywhere from two to four hours. And we pass these tubes or sheaths into the groins, the right and left groins, nothing is felt. Your patient is under general anesthesia. One part of the procedure involves taking a catheter that we have in the right atrium of the heart and we have to get to the left atrium of the heart. And I'll show you other slides. But this is an example of a catheter going from right to left atrium. And we do our work in the left atrium. This is called transeptal puncture. In the old days, it was a dangerous procedure, but technology has allowed this knock on wood, knock on wood to be quite, we be very safe. Here's my partner and I working during atrial fibrillation and ablation when I had less gray hair. <clears throat> uh, and you can see the multiple screens we're looking at. This is EKGs, these are intracardiac electrical signals. This is X-ray. This is the ultrasound. We have a, a intracardiac ultrasound. And this is our computerized mapping. So there's a lot going on, as they say. What we're looking at on one of the screens, the patients get a preoperative CAT scan a couple weeks before, and we use this preoperative CAT scan to help form our own mold, so to speak, our own model of the patient's heart. By moving a catheter in the heart, we recreate the CAT with the CAT scan's help just where the structures of the heart are to help us figure out where we're gonna burn. This is the left upper pulmonary vein, the left lower pulmonary vein, the right upper, the right lower, and we use these different structures and I electrically isolate them, and I'll discuss it more. This is an old x-ray, and what we see here is this ring catheter sitting in the right upper pulmonary vein of a patient, getting ready to do some ablation of that vein. This catheter that's sitting in a tube is gonna come out of the tube, go over to this right pulmonary vein and do its ablation. This is a wire in the back of the heart known as a coronary sinus that we use to assist in mapping the electrical signals. A different schematic shows the left atrium. As I mentioned, we do our work in the left atrium and the procedure we perform is known as pulmonary vein isolation. Within the left atrium, we have four pulmonary vein openings, and we check to see if there's inappropriate electrical activity traveling from a pulmonary vein into the left atrium. If there is, and there frequently, and if almost always there, there are abnormal electrical signals, we will then electrically isolate around these four veins so that the signals no longer get from the pulmonary vein into the heart per se. Some of the tools that are used, you can see here, and I'll show an, another slide in a minute of our Tacticath contact force catheter, which is very helpful. Uh, here's the ring catheter that you just saw on a prior slide. More recently, we have a much better way to map electrical signals of the heart. It's known as the grid, and it acquires signals in multiple planes, gives us much more information about the electrical system of the patient's heart much more quickly, much more safely than in the past. More flexible catheter, that is of great benefit. The ablation catheter that we use, we use radiofrequency energy. We don't use cryoablation. Uh, the two techniques are 
very similar in efficacy and safety. Uh, they're really interchangeable from institution to institution. But our radio frequency catheter ablation has this contact force sensor. Light beams are sent from the tip back to the, uh, to the console and the information gained from these, elect from these light beams tells us how much force is being applied to that tip to the inside wall of the heart. In the old days, we had no idea. We weren't sure if we were against the wall of the heart or not, whether we were pushing too hard or we weren't. Now we know exactly if the amount of force we're applying to the inside of the heart and it has helped us immensely over the last few years. This is an example of a model of the heart in which we're working with, you can see the chest forward going left, the chest forward going right. You can see there's a catheter inside the heart, but unfortunately, zero grams, zero grams, zero grams. So we're not going to burn with this catheter because it is not against tissue and any type of energy, energy delivery applied will be ineffective. Here's our grid catheter that I mentioned a few minutes, sorry. Here's our grid catheter that I mentioned a few minutes ago in the left lower pulmonary vein in two different angles. We acquire all this electrical information of each of these veins very quickly. It tells us if the veins are electrically active and need to be treated or not. So this is the grid catheter and quick accumulation of information. Another slide, and you can see this bright blue color. This tells us that the electrical activity within this heart is very strong. And that's fine if it's only in the left atrium. But as you can see, in these veins, in these stumps, these veins, there's a lot of blue. That's not good. That means these veins are not electrically isolated. So what we need to do is take the blue of these veins and make them all look gray so that we know that there's no electrical activity traveling from the veins into the heart and we could obtain success. So this little complicated slide, again, it is the same idea. We have the left atrium. We see a lot of healthy tissue in the veins. So we draw lines of where our target's gonna be. And then we go into video game mode because these are the lines that we're gonna to create to electrically isolate these veins. And this is one of the burns delivered right now. You can see one being applied here with five grams of pressure. We like between three and 23 um, would be good numbers, but we like to get more than a couple. And then we just start burning along here. Now it's not quite as simple as a video game, but the concept is to follow these lines to create electrical isolation. This is during or near the end of an ablation where we've taken where we've taken all of this blue that used to be here and now we're discoloring it and no longer blue any further. And the only blue that exists is in the, the atrial tissue, not in the vein tissue. And these are pulmonary vein isolation. These four veins have now been electrically isolated and the, the healthy tissue remains. So that's what we do. Uh, we can either use an impedance navigation system, and today during an AFib ablation I did on a young gentleman, we used pure magnetic navigation. They are complementary techniques, and for one reason or another, uh, I may choose to use the magnet versus uh, impedance, and the impedance, there's patches placed on the patient's body that creates XYZ planes, and it measures the impedance between the catheter and the heart and those patches, the information used from the impedance is impedances in those three planes tells us where we are in the heart, as opposed to the magnet mode, which I use today. In the future, not yet uh, widely available uh, and approved only in Europe, is something that we're excited about probably a few years down the line known as pulse field ablation, electroporation. This technology, it's different. It's not heat, it's not cold. It, they, we deliver high voltage, short duration electrical impulses and it creates pores in the membrane of the cardiac cells. 
without thermal effect. As a result, there's less chance for collateral damage and therefore less complications, a much more focused energy delivery. And the hope is that, that by it being a faster procedure, there's less radiation to the patient and the staff. That's for the future. This is what the catheter looks like. And we put it into a vein, you turn it on, you go to the next vein, et cetera, et cetera. Very fast procedure. We're all hoping it works out to its billing. This is the pulse field ablation of the future, we're hoping, where the nearby esophagus and the nearby phrenic vein are not affected, or they could be affected by freezing or by our heat technique. The phrenic nerve is very uncommon and almost never is a long-standing problem, but still we keep it in mind. The esophagus is a major thing that we keep in mind. The risk of, esoph of life-threatening esophageal damage is well under 1%, but uh, we're always very aware and we use a cooling system to minimize the likelihood of heating up the esophagus. Regardless, in the future, the pulse field ablation will take away this concern completely. So presently, after someone's had a catheter ablation, out of bed in six hours, discharge home the next morning or possibly late that same day. We like to keep people on their blood thinner for at least two months. I will keep them on their flecainide or antiarrhythmic drug uh, for three to six months while the heart heals from the procedure. And then there will be heart monitoring, especially if patients complain of palpitations after the procedure and which likely will give you a monitor anyway to make sure there's not silent fibrillation present following the ablation. So to cure AFib with ablation as of this year, ablation has been repeatedly shown to be more effective at preventing AFib recurrences as opposed to drugs. Continues to evolve with, with improving success rates, there's better, be there's better basic science understanding, less complications. The cure, absolute complete cure is 80%, but you may need a repeat procedure and you may need to be on drug therapy for six months. The longer you've been an AFib, the less likely we can cure it. The damage has already been done. If you're in AFib for more than a year, the likelihood of curing the AFib becomes significantly less than 80% and closer to 45%. There's less than a 1% risk of a life-threatening complication. However, we are incredibly careful and mindful when we do the procedure to minimize risk of stroke, blood around the heart, injuring the esophagus, and of course, death. The ability to stop anticoagulation is unclear, meaning that if you're felt to be a high stroke risk, that then, despite the AFib ablation, I am very hesitant and in fact, reluctant to stop the blood thinner. So in patients with symptomatic atrial fibrillation who are not interested in taking medications or medications are not working, ablation is an excellent option to consider. AFib is many diseases with many stages and manifestations. There's no single therapy that will ever be appropriate for all circumstances. Most patients will require a combination of therapies. Prevention of stroke is a major concern in all AFib patients. Catheter ablation has provided cure, especially for the people with paroxysmal AFib, AFib that stops and starts. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, weight loss, treating sleep apnea, and avoiding alcohol are very important. So the final portion of the talk deals with stroke prevention, the thing we always want to avoid in all situations. 15% of all strokes are secondary to atrial fibrillation, and these are big strokes and cause major morbidity and mortality. Aspirin and Plavix do not prevent stroke in AFib. It's asked all the time. Warfarin has been the gold standard. 64% relative reduction versus not taking warfarin at reducing stroke. Warfarin was used for more than three decades before research came out showing its efficacy. That would never happen in today's society, thank goodness. So 
how do we determine who should be on a blood thinner? Well, most people should be on a blood thinner, but the way to risk stratify is called the CHADS VAST score. Many of you have heard of this and know your, may even know your score, but it's based on heart failure, high blood pressure, older age, diabetes, prior stroke, coronary disease or aneurysm or peripheral arterial disease, middle age or female gender. You get points based on these characteristics. Two if you're older than 75, and two if you've had a prior stroke. The higher your number, the higher your annual risk of stroke. This was developed more than 12 years ago in England, Birmingham Schema, published. So as opposed to warfarin, you guys have all heard of the newer anaplogos. They aren't newer anymore. They've been out for over 10 years actually 11 years now with the first one, but the newer anticoagulants compared to warfarin, 18% reduction in ischemic strokes versus warfarin, 50% decrease in intracranial bleeding. The worst type of side effect that could happen is a bleed in the brain. And this has, these newer agents have a 50% reduction in intracranial bleeding. There's a trend towards improved survival with the newer blood thinners. You do not need to get INRs checked. You don't have to worry about food or medication interaction nearly as much. Uh, they, are, they are expensive. That's the only hiccup with these medications. We have to dose the new medications based on kidney functions. I'm always checking labs on these people to make sure patients are properly dosed. It's not, the new blood thinners are not used for people with mechanical heart valves. They can be for tissue heart valves, but not mechanical, not metal. And these are not bad drugs. They got bad press five years ago, eight years ago. They are not bad drugs and they all have reversal agents now. Pradaxa was the first one. It was been approved for more than 10 years. It showed superiority versus warfarin. It's twice a day. Some people get GI side effects. We don't use Pradaxa a lot at the biggest tran at this institution, but it is a reasonable drug. I just, when they had problems with GI side effects many years ago, so I haven't been using it, but it's not an unreasonable drug. Zorelto is used very commonly. It's attractive because it's only once a day, but you have to remember to take it with food and you have to make sure your healthcare provider confirms that you're taking the proper dose. Uh, it was studied in the highest risk population and showed favorable results. There is an increased risk of bleeding from the stomach with Zorelto versus warfarin, but no increase in fatal bleeding. In, it actually is a reduction in fatal bleeding, no difference in major bleeding. Eloquist, very popular. We use a lot of it as well. It's shown superiority versus warfarin. It has shown a decreased mortality versus warfarin, less GI bleeding versus warfarin, less major bleeding than warfarin, but it is two times a day and was not studied as a high-risk population. A very good drug. Savasa is actually a very good drug. There's probably very few people in the audience taking it because it was, it was developed in Japan and was marketed very poorly in the United States. It's used widely in Europe, but not in the United States, simply a marketing issue. So then we got Mr. Watchman. You guys have heard of Watchman. So many of you guys may have a Watchman. Eisenhower has done very well in terms of helping our uh, population have strokes prevented with the use of a Watchman. We've put in about 420 of these now. Uh, we're the third leading and planner in all of California, including any hospital you could think of. And a lot of it is not because we're hunting, 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 it's because we have a lot of older patients who have AFib at Eisenhower. It was the first FDA approved device to close what's called the left atrial appendage that I'll show you in a second. You do need to take blood thinner prior to the Watchman and you need to stay on a blood thinner for a certain amount of time after the Watchman, whether it's, whether it's six weeks, whether it's three months, all that is a little unclear and evolving in the research. But the point is after the Watchman, you still need to be on a blood thinner for some amount of time while the Watchman matures in the heart. Then you'll go from the Eliquis or Xarelto or Coumadin over to aspirin and Plavix. And then long-term, we'd like you to take baby aspirin. 
the other FDA approved device, the Amplatzer plug, and I'll show you a picture of that in, in, um, in a moment. And that is FDA approved and may be used in people where the watchman doesn't quite fit. Also, uh, other than what we do in the electrophysiology laboratory with watchman and Amplatzer is the surgeons, the cardiothoracic surgeons can treat this left atrial appendage as well. During the time of other open heart surgery, someone's getting mitral valve surgery, someone's having bypass surgery, they can, the CT surgeons can take off the left atrial appendage. They could just cut it off or sew it shut or staple it shut. And then you don't have to worry about clot anymore because the left atrial appendage isn't there. And that's where over 90% of strokes from AFib originate from. Also, if someone does not need an open heart surgery, and they need their left atrial appendage closed, and they're not a candidate for a watchman, the surgeons can use thoroscopes or tubes that go between the ribs and get to the left, left atrial appendage by that technique and can close off or what's called clip the left atrial appendage. The, so this is a fallback in my mind for people that are not watchman candidates or that can absolutely not at all take a blood thinner for any period of time. But I'll play the movie. I can hear it. But we're gonna, we are going to go in the vein and the groin. It's all numbed up. You're under anesthesia for the procedure, which is about, four. the procedure lasts about 40 minutes. We advance the watchman up into the right chamber of the heart over the left chamber of the heart and into the appendix. Here, the left atrium, the left atrial appendage, and the watchman opens up, and the left atrial appendage is occluded by the watchman. And over time, this seals over, becomes part of the heart. This will seal right over. And there's the occluded appendage, and blood clots can no longer come out of it. So this is just another slide showing the same thing. Here's the person. We go in a vein in the groin where you don't feel anything. We advance it up to the right chambers of the heart. We traverse from the right atrium over to the left atrium, from the left atrium into the out pocket called the appendage, where we place the watchman and open it up and prevent stroke from happening. And that's just giving you another look at it where the blood clots usually form and shoot out. There are multiple sizes, about five sizes of the watchman. I tell patients 88% of the time we can find a shoe that fits. About 12% of the time, they're just not a size that fits and we can't do it. In that situation, we may think of in the future about putting an Amplatzer device in or the surgical atria clip. And this is a, this is a picture of the Amplatzer cardiac plug you can see the disc and the occluder, disc and occluder, and you don't have to get as deep in the appendage. So in people that you can't get the watchman deep in, this may be an option. So, and this is just a beautiful view of a golf hole that Bill Stark has played many times and has parred many times. That's the 10th hole at Shadow Ridge at uh, the Marriott Timeshare nearby. So that is an up-to-date summary of atrial fibrillation, a very common disorder. Millions of people around the world suffer from it. It's become increasingly frequent. It will continue to become increasingly frequent given the aging of our world's population. Uh, there are many aspects to it and we wanna prevent stroke. We want patients to feel well and I am open to questions that may have come up during this discussion.